So you're off the hook. Thank you. Okay, we have no old business. Move into item number four, superintendent report. Thank you. Uh, before I start my report, I'd like to recognize Lee Karen. Lee Karen, the principal of Trinity uh, School, is now a recent graduate of doctoral school. So he is now Dr. Lee Karen. So please stand up, Lee. I just stay some chronic absenteeism in rural northern Maine, and at some point I'd like to present my findings yeah. to you. Uh, it's very interesting, and uh, you know, it's when you look at it, it just kind of hits you in the face uh, how uh, there's lots of things we can do as a school, as a district, as a community to, to make some improvements and, and hopefully get school uh, kids to school more consistently. Yes, congratulations, Dr. Karen. <laughs> Thank you. And congratulations on your successful defense of your dissertation. We, we would we would appreciate the questions, as a matter of fact. Absolutely. Absolutely, we'll make sure you plug that in. Okay, so in my report, um, I think it's uh, when we talk about pandemic preparedness, we, we've gone through a long two years of working through the uncharted waters, I call it, of, of the pandemic. As much as people have been patient with us, I, I appreciate that because we've all gone through things that we're not used to dealing with on a daily basis. But uh, we've come to that point where I think the mask can be removed or be optional. And I think the governor of Maine has come out today at one o'clock in a public uh, announcement and address that she made. Uh, she set the date for Wednesday, uh, March 9th, to be when Maine will move from universal recommended masking to, to optional masking throughout Maine, especially schools and childcare and whatnot. So that, that was good news because most superintendents were we're actually working very hard with Maine CDC to get them to relax their, their standards so we actually could get an SOP that was more friendly to keep kids in school and, and at some point uh, go back to an optional masking um, that, that schools really wanted. So I, I think uh, with the governor coming on with that, it really set the tone that, that you know, there was some people who did listen to superintendents when we did talk about that. So we've been very true and very honored to the, uh, the CDC guidelines all along. Uh, that was what was in our meeting, of course, when we held a meeting yesterday with the Worcester County Superintendents. It seems a little fuzzy right now that we're, you know, with the U.S. CDC guidelines making the orange, yellow, and green, that, and the Worcester County's looking at a red model, oh, excuse me, an orange model. Um, a lot of that is back, backlog of cases, and I think we're going to take that into consideration. And, and being in rural Maine, um, we're kind of, these cases will be kind of last. They will take care of southern Maine and work their way north. And a lot of the rural counties are still in that orange code because um, of the backlog of all these cases that they just couldn't keep up with when, when Omicron finally hit. And we all talked about Omicron being in high school that we're going to have a real hit and then it's going to kind of go away and we're experiencing that now. Right in our own school, and I'll have the school nurses discuss this at length, but um, we have zero cases today. And to total right now, we have six cases since returning. So. The idea of waiting a week before we go optional seems to be plain and true that, that we, the cases are going down and we did see this all of a sudden catch on because of vacation. So and I think we kind of predicted that with Omicron anyway. So um, the schools I talked to, there are some schools and the most recent one is Patel. They had a meeting, an emergency meeting on Monday and, and for their, their reasons they went on Tuesday. Um, many schools that I talked to are waiting to the 14th, some are going on the 7th. Um, I think with the governor coming out as the ninth, putting the school should be changing over on the ninth, she had left room for schools to make their own decision. So I think as a board, you, you'll see tonight if you make a motion, you, you have the freedom to make that motion where you want to do it. Um, I'll just be honest with you, there was a little bit of a transition time that I think schools need to kind of get their teachers prepared, get their public prepared. And as much as it's easy transition for some groups of people, it's, it's a rather challenging one for others because it's a land of non uncertainty because we're going to take the mask off and, and what, what it could create. So I, I think it is important that we get some transition time there to send letters out, get people uh, antiquated. Like we still have an SOP that still talks about quarantining because if you have a family member that is, is uh, COVID positive and you're in that family, then you may need to quarantine. Um, as far as school cases, we're doing away with that. Um, the other piece is the pool testing. The state's encouraging pool testing to stay active in our schools because it should be a lot more accurate as the case numbers drop down. If we have cases, our pools have come back negative. So that's another sign why we can move forward and take the mask off. 
So I, I think as this district, we've done a good job. Um, some people like what we do, some people didn't like what we did, but I think we did everything in the best interest that we could for the community, um, the elderly people, our students involved in the families that, that has now. I, I've heard from both sides, um, yay and nay, we want to do this. There was still some, some adversity out there, but I do believe the nurses can present some data that will help. Um, I base it on three things. You, you, you may have other three things you think are more better to base it on, but I took our, our school cases, have dropped tremendously. Um, and I watched it before vacation, now I'm watching it after vacation, and it's still dropping. Hospitalizations, I talked to both hospitals in the area, those have gone down tremendously also. And then I also looked at vaccine rates in the area, Our, ours is probably the highest it can be. If you're not vaccinated by now, you've made a choice not to be vaccinated, and that's your choice. So if you are gonna be vaccinated, I think this is the best we can do for vaccines. And we are having a, a, in our schools, a 80, 80, percent or more so that those are good numbers so in, when you look at those numbers i find it's time to to move on and be optional and i'm asking so right, thank you did you want to have the school nurses just provide a brief i, I, I think it would be a brief brief and i have done uh, some, the, some discussion yeah. around this and i think there's still some pieces that the public families need to know about the sop that they're still uh, if you are um and trina will get this length if you are positive COVID and you have to go home for five days, day six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, if you're, if you're still um, without symptoms, you can go back to school, but you still have to wear a mask when you come back to school. Yes. So there's things that we have to make sure it's clear to people as we make this transition. Have anything about this? Is that on? I don't think so. Yeah, I just think we just need an update on the changes in the SLP, obviously moving to optional masking. Um, as of right now, we don't have- Flip the switch. Flip the switch. On the call. Is that better? No. Can you help her, James? Yeah, James, help me, James. <laughs> I'm over at home. You can go on. Push it. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, as for the SOP, we just had a school nurse meeting this afternoon with Emily Pullman, our school nurse assistant for the state. There is not an updated SOP and probably won't be in until sometime the next week. Um, so what we have for right now is what we have to go by. Um, the things that we did talk about today, as Mr. Doak said, um, with the cases we've had um, now, if you're positive on day six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you do have to wear your mask in school. Um, the other things that were talked about today, if there were we're not currently contact tracing in schools, um, if we know about a case. So say a parent calls us and says, I'm positive, my child is not vaccinated. That child is going to have to quarantine. They're gonna to have to stay home. We're gonna to have to go back to some of the guidelines that we had before. So if the student is not able to isolate from the parent, then the parent is going to have to do their, their isolation for five days. The student will start their five days after that. So they might be out for 10 days. If there's multiple family members, so a mom gets it, they do, she does her five days, dad gets it on day six of mom, so the kids are with mom's five days, they're with dad's five days, and then they do their five days. So we might be looking at an unvaccinated child who would need to quarantine for 15 days. It's gonna be on a case-by-case -case basis, you know that. Um, again, if they're vaccinated, um, they would be allowed to come to school if they're not vaccinated, they're not. These are only cases that we know about when we're not contact tracing. If we have a student in third grade that we, you know, is know is positive, we're not looking at the students in that classroom to say who needs to quarantine and who doesn't need to quarantine. That's not that's optional right now in the SOP. Again, they could not give us any real concrete guidance today and just said that look for changes in the next week or so. So we don't really know that. Um, if we have, if you might have a staff member who is not vaccinated but their child goes to school and their child becomes positive. They're not able to isolate. That staff member would need to, to quarantine. Um, so again, I think it's gonna be a case by case um, where we do still have pool testing if the students are actively involved in pool testing um, and they are exposed to um, somebody at home. I believe they're still, still going to need to quarantine, correct? No, if they're pool no, testing, they're not. not for pool but where that kind of gets a little tricky is if they're not actively involved in pool testing. So there are new students that's signing up for pool testing. They've not been in, they've not been tested. Um, 
and they might have an exposure on Sunday, but they signed up and they're going to start full testing this week. If they have not actively been involved with it, that doesn't count. They're still going to have to quarantine. So it's they have to have been in it. We've had some students that have um, decided to opt out of pool testing. They're not like taken out of it, but they have not been tested. Um, so they can opt back in, but they're still going to have to have that week of testing, correct, in order for that to count. So it's kind of just a few little things we're going to have to. Right. And you anticipate SLP changes anyway. So we do. We some, some of that's likely going to address some of that. Some of that's likely to address that. Right. So we'll um, just plan for you to give us an update as soon as we get to that. Yeah, right. I think so. And I think as Mr. Doak and I had talked this afternoon, I think it's important that we do kind of get something out to parents, letting them know because it's, you know, there may still be, like we've kind of been, we're not really quarantining, you know, as much because we're masked, they can come to school, you know, if there's been an exposure. And now suddenly we're going to be saying, you know, your child might not be able to come to school if they're not vaccinated and they've been exposed at home. Again, that's if parents let us know that, we hope that they do that. We really want to portray like if, if you're sick or if your kids are sick, stay home. Like we don't want anything going around the school. It, it might just be a cold. You know, it's not necessarily COVID that, you know, we really need to get back to that educating students, educating staff, educating parents, you know, if you're sick, we, we don't want you here. You need to, to stay home and be well. Right. And there has been a request from the Teachers Association to purchase a KN95 and N95 mask, um, which we did, and they're, they're on site, they're in every school, and we still have a stock problem in the bus garage, so. Um, if there, because there are still teachers that have seen us that are very nervous and they want to wear the extra protection. So, if it's their peace of mind, if they can be more comfortable in school, then like I guess it, it go for it. I guess I mean um, that's their choice, um, and that's the nice thing about the optional masking; it gives people choice now. So, um, so we do have boxes of those masks available to people that need them. Does anybody have any questions for Trina? What about kids who are too young to be vaccinated who come to school? How are they protected when we go optional? Well, it is still an optional is the word. So, you know, they can, if their parents choose and they choose to wear a mask, they they can, it is still their option to, to, but to wear But staff won't be required to? Their staff wouldn't be required to? Their staff, if masking is optional, we can't require staff to wear masks if we're not requiring anybody else to wear masks. Thank you. It's all, I mean, we're all working as, as we get the information. I mean, the only thing we have to be thinking about too is that, you know, wearing a mask, required to wear a mask from day six to 10 basically identifies mm -hmm. clearly, you know, if someone had COVID. And so we just need to be mindful that we would not want, you know, that to create issues, you know, for, for bullying or anything of that sort that would, that would target those those kids because they're subject to and that is something that we've worried about because right now with everybody wearing a mask you don't really know you know somebody might be out for a few days or right it's just, it's just identified. Yeah, i think it's going to take an effect but we also don't know um when we do go optional there may be a lot of students who opt to wear their mask so we don't know what that's going to look like um for students or for staff and, and i suppose a parent could choose to keep their child out the extra days if they absolutely not to have them wear a mask and move you know that. Yeah, absolutely. That would, the nurses would be supportive of that. They the would be school like to stay out a longer period of time if, if that was um, something. And we already do that now. If they hit, you know, day six and they're still having symptoms and not recovered, they automatically would stay out their, their 10 days anyway. So is it safe to say that our school nurses support going optional at this time? <laughs> put them on the spot, Ron. Put them on the spot. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm holding in, listen to night here. Um, I think if it's an option and people can choose whether they're not going to wear their mask or whether they are going to wear their mask. Um, I think it's a, it's a preference for on. Um, I personally am still going to wear my mask, but that's just how I feel. Um, and I'm not saying that everybody around me has to, um, but that's what makes me feel comfortable because if you think about it. We work in the nurse's office. So who comes to the nurse's well, office? I was just going to say the guidance hasn't changed for medical. You know, but like, who comes to the nurse's office? Sick people. So, you know, I would certainly want to protect myself. Um, but again, I think it's, it's it's going to be an option. So, and we're going to have to see. I mean, this is, 
if we look over the next three weeks or a month and we see our cases have really exploded, we may need to, to revisit this. You know, it's not going to be a cut and dry situation, I don't believe. Any other questions for Trina or the school nurses? Seeing none, thank you. We're going to take that uh, item, actual item up at a link, uh, later in the agenda. So I'll move back to Superintendent Dope for items for information. Okay. Uh, we do have two retirements. Uh, Ken Westine, the auto body instructor, Cable Regional Tech Center is retiring. And David McGoin, a bus driver, custodian at Cable Community School, is going to be retiring also. You know, hires Ju uh, Julie Anderson, Ed Tech 111 from Life Skills Program at Cable Community School. And Thomas Beckham is the boys' volleyball coach at Cable High School. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Superintendent Dalton? Seeing none, we'll move into item six, public comments. I believe uh, Lori is going to read a public comment received, and then I can have two additional individuals I will call up. Okay, so I just received an email from Sherry Hayes, who is a resident of Caribou and has two children to attend CTS. Thank you. She's writing this letter to strongly encourage the school board members to honor the families of this community and their right to make medical decisions for their own children regarding face masks and other medical decisions that may come up in the future. It should have been the parents' decision from the beginning. You use the excuse of making decisions for the students' well-being and safety but blatantly ignored the issues at hand, which would include the impact of the pausing up here, sorry. <laughs> Policies on the children's mental health and education. Given the new guidance from the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the CDC, there is absolutely no reason why the school would mandate use of, for their staff and their students. She feels that it is beyond time that Caribou School changes their mask policy to optional, effective immediately. Please let it be known that our family does not consent to mask use for our children any longer. Sherry Gates. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kylie Morell. Just check to see this, I'll go on. So my name is Kylie Morrell. Um, I have two children in the school system at CCS. And for the past two years, we have complied with federal, state, and local mandates and recommendations. We have made sacrifices for ourselves and for others, both known and unknown. We've been sub subject to the repetitive fear instilled in us by news stations, social media, our neighbors, and even our family members. There once was a time we judged each other by the color of our skin, and today we judge based on our decision to wear a mask or inject ourselves with a vaccine. We, without even realizing it, froze our critical thinking capabilities and our ability to question the science that didn't make sense, but was rationalized by fear and by making us believe we were doing the right thing. But what exactly is the right thing? And what exactly is the greater good? When you assessed for your family, for yourself and your family, uh, what was for the greater good? What helped you make an informed decision? Did you listen to two sides of the story or just one? Were mental health effects and increased suicide rates taken into consideration? Were the lack of educational opportunities for our children along with taking away their sports and extracurricular activities considered? Was time not spent with loved ones who may or may not still be here considered? Maybe. I mean, I expect the answer to change with every person and their individual experiences. What I don't understand is if this matter was so detrimental to my health and my safety and my children's health and safety, why the constant reminders? Why the constant incentives? The and why the consequence of punishment for those who believe differently for one reason or another? Not once was exercise and a healthy lifestyle ever promoted. It was all about masks and the quick fix. I do not need someone to get on the television every day to remind me to wear a mask for mine and my children's safety. I do not need SOP guidelines to tell me how my child can remain safe. I mean, let's use some common sense. 
I do not need emails or calls from school administrators telling me my son isn't wearing his mask properly. I know he doesn't wear his mask properly. He has asthma and reasons not once addressed this entire time that masks have been required. We've been crossing over into dangerous territory where individuals' health risks and disabilities were not taken into consideration when designing the one-size-fits-all mask mandate. I want to cry every day I drop my children off at school because I know I'm not doing what's in their best interest, and neither are you. This past year, my son has been bullied by both peers and his teachers. There was one situation where a teacher physically pulled him aside, then yelled at him to pull up his mask. He was punished with in-house suspension and the teacher suffered no such consequences. My children walk by classrooms and the teacher's lounge every day and see teachers without their masks on. Teachers stand in front of their classrooms without masks while yelling at the children to pull theirs up. Teachers have not suffered the same consequences or been subject to the same rules as our children this entire time. I know teachers are getting tired, but they have abused our children with their words and their actions for the past two years. And I'm not talking about all teachers, but I am talking about some teachers. Everyone has suffered in some way, but no one has suffered as much as our children. The parents should have been setting the standard from the beginning, and masks should have been optional without question. The fact we are putting a future date on this matter is ridiculous. People have had two years to prepare for this. We are moving on, and there are more pressing issues at hand, and I'm hoping we can address the real issue, which is our children's education and the embarrassing curriculum and educational standards they have been subject to and the fact they don't want to go to school anymore. Let's at least salvage what we have left for this school year and make mass optional immediately. Thank you for your time. And now Abel Hayes. Hey, Jim. Hi, my name is Abel, and I think mas a mask should, should be optional because um, some people might think they want to have masks, and some people might think they don't want to have masks, and people should think uh, what they uh, want to do, and they should do what they want to do. Great, thank you, Abel. You did a great job. No further public comment. We will move into back to my agenda. New business item 7.1. Consider optional masking for RSU schools. I think we had earlier conversation or presentation surrounding uh, information. There's some additional informational points in regards, I think, that was highlighted at uh, the decline in the number of COVID cases in RC39 schools, the decline in the number of hospitalizations. We've heard from medical uh, advisors as it relates to that as well. And that vaccination rates are at the point where they are higher than ever. Those are some of the comments. Does anybody have any questions? Do we still have the current recommendation of the two doctors? Okay. Uh, the recommendation of the two doctors? Yes, I, I believe so. Yes, we do. I did talk to one today. You want to know the, the current recommendations from our two medical advisors. I did talk to Dr. Flynn today, and um, I didn't get a chance to talk to Dr. Mark Stein. But he did, uh, we talked just prior to vacation. They recommended the seventh. Dr. Morningstar? Uh, so uh, both Dr. Well, Dr. Morningstar recommended uh, Monday the seventh, but he felt comfortable giving a week to see what would happen with vacation. Uh, Dr. Flynn also strongly encouraged the optional mask um, for some of the reasons that were stated um, to the point that, you know, um, we can't keep living our lives behind a mask. Um, he felt very strongly hospitalizations have dropped. Uh, I checked our cases have dropped tremendously, so he was all for it too. Does any, any other board members have any other questions or issues? What? I I know I emailed you about the Woodland, the Union 122 bus uh, rulings right now with maintains masking until their meeting, which is the 17th. Yeah, the letter that Woodland brought out said they weren't going to hold their board meeting until March 17th, and they're going to mask until March, at least March 17th, if not a little bit later. They may be ones that change on the 20th or something, but 
Um, the letter stated that the RSU 39 students would have to wear their mask on the, the bus. Well, that would be the Woodland bus. The Woodland transports their kids to Gilbert, so they have a right to determine what they do with their buses. So once they arrive here, they're not supposed to. Once they arrive here and we go optional, they get off the bus, then they, they can come in and wear, they, if they want to wear the mask on, if they don't, they don't have to. Any it's other, just their bus. Any it's other questions? Is there, is there any reason to go sooner than the recommendations of medical advice? No, there's no reason at all. Uh, it's just that the only issue is the transition piece because there's been a lot of questions presented to me. I've heard from the other side also about needing to wear the mask. So there's just that whole piece of misinformation. Um, you know, but uh, there is no need to wait till Monday if you don't want to. But there is a piece that gives us a chance to put a letter out to the families. They've always really commended us on our correspondence with them. Uh, teachers are still kind of up in the air and what happens next. So it's, like I said, this is gonna be an easy adjustment for some, it's gonna be a little harder adjustment for others. So uh, we gotta take both parties into consideration in what we do, but it's totally up to the board what, what you'd like to do. Right, and I think everybody saw we did get correspondence from parents on both sides. So we did, yes, and it was concerning. Um, we just need to be mindful. We had as many on the fear, they were, they were afraid for their children. They also were looking at the data uh, it's interesting that we only have four pediatric intensive care units and they're at Bangor. Um, and we've had hundreds of deaths of children from this virus and one is too many. So uh, sometimes I think freedom is, uh, it's not free and then you have to be considerate of others in order to make it work. And I think of the World War II people with their gas masks on fighting for us to have the same liberties we have today. Nobody ever said anything. So I think when it comes down to the little people, it becomes more intense and personal. However, it's nature to uh, cover hidden hands first when something happens. And I think we did it in good faith and without malice in our hearts. And I think that needs to be understood and respected. There seems to be that I've, I've had parents in me too about the bullying that could happen if my child wears a mask when we're optional. That really should be no tolerance about that either. So, I mean, and you shouldn't be bullied for not wearing a mask. So, I mean, it's just that that's the environment. See, that's that uneasiness that people have. And I, we really haven't put out any follow up correspondence for what you're going to vote on. Uh, I'm not saying you couldn't act this tomorrow or Friday, but Monday. It seems to be a, a little easier time for us to get that correspondence out to ease some of it. I did have a lot of parents on the vacation uh, contact me about their appreciate the letter. That went out. That at least we were thinking about getting the mask off, and and you know it's not soon enough for some. And I understand that. And we respect those opinions also, but there's still that transition piece. But I, I'm here to, to tell you that it's time to go optional for sure. And if you feel it should be tomorrow or Monday, I'll honor that and I'll do what I can either way. But. Um, there's no reason uh, the mask shouldn't come off at some point because our cases are. If, when do we ever put it back on? I hope we never have to go universal mask again. I think most main superintendents will tell you that. But if we get to an outbreak status under main main requirement, I think that's something we got to pay attention to, and it may have to come back. But mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I hope never has to. Your school nurse is over there. Just just the details that she added in two years. Probably need families need a few days to get some information and understand that this isn't due to COVID. There are going to be other things that are going to be happening. We're going to be monitoring the situation very carefully. But, uh, One thing uh, that you need to, to remember too is the USCC has done a, about face, and it's no longer about the transmission pieces, it's all about hospitalizations. And that's what they're going on now for their color schemes. And, which is why the backlog and the county's always kind of lost. So I think that's an issue there. So um, I'll, I'll make it work either way. Uh, I do think Lon's correct. There are parents that, that have already called with questions around, you know, do we have to wear a mask if we're positive and return to school? Yes, you do. I mean, we have to put that out there. You know, it's totally up to you, but, you know. It seems like we've been receiving information at warp speed from all of these sources that we look to. Uh, whether it's the CDC or the national, um, the governor. I mean, we're getting things by the minute, by the hour. It, it seems as if we might need to do that same thing. Uh, um, uh, the seventh seem a good, seems like a good, uh, a good time for us. But is it a good time for everybody? I mean, that's 
I have Lindsay with hand up. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I think I'm going to piggyback on what Jan was talking about when we were talking about the Remote Learning Academy for those students who are under the seventh grade and have fear of coming back, optional masking, and their kids could thrive in a remote learning situation. We have nothing to offer them right now. So they're thrust into a situation that may be harmful for that child. And we, have, we don't have anything to offer yet. And so when we talked way back, way, way back last year, um, that we thought that the Remote Learning Academy should could benefit all age levels. Some, not the really young children, we've talked about how they do need to be in school, but I'm, I'm worried about that age group under seventh grade going optional. Yeah. I'm, well, that's the question that every superintendent of Maine has been addressed with, and, and, and I think it's just younger cases, younger kids, the cases I've been is, is, is strong, and, and I think every superintendent's at a point to, to, that I've talked to across the state that have called me also, for my opinion, is optional. They all want to go optional, and then the younger kids, I feel for those parents, um, I think they have a choice to wear the mask, and they should mask up when they come to school if they're not vaccinated. And, and, and hope for the best. I think that's it's not the easiest answer to give, but um, you know, and it's also the kids that want the mask off tomorrow. And, and what do we do if we go two more days and wait till Monday? I mean, that's just as aggravating too. But we're not going to whatever decision you make is not <laughs> always going to keep everybody happy. But we're only doing the best we can with what we have. And it is a transition for people. Like I said, there are some that easily can make that transition, and there are some that are going to struggle with that on Thursday tomorrow morning if we make a about face and put out a robo call today so you know i think that's why you know we'll have, we have to be mindful of what the what what feedback we get if there's an issue and, and i think hopefully that the rsu can be agile and adaptive enough to you know bring something forward if, you know, we're, there was... seeing, if we're seeing that as an issue or concern that you know because you know in terms of a, a remote learning need. I mean, it sounds like there's some pieces in place, but I don't know. But I mean, we'd have to just see what the res, you know, response would be. I mean, right now we gauge it on the feedback we got. And, the, you know. The Brewster the County Superintendents met Tuesday. We, we meet Tuesdays at 11 o'clock. The first meeting that was really contentious. And what we've been doing is following the CDC recommendations all along. And the county is in an orange color, and, and we've gotten explanations for that. But just to get the group to settle down and, and listen and understand why it's okay maybe to go optional, it, it was contentious for a while. There are many schools still in the county that are not going to go optional even Monday. I probably will have a little more open air now that the governor has mandated or come out and said the ninth. But there were superintendents that called me this morning that weren't sure what they were going to do. Most were looking at the seventh, some looked at the 14th. I got two superintendents from Southern Maine that are going Monday the seventh. Um, you know, they, they're just not sure because they've always followed that CDC. We're breaking away from the CDC, which is what some groups have asked us to do all along, but we're doing it for the first time. I think, um, I, I feel like I got to throw my opinion out there so everybody else has. <laughs> Um, you know, I think people need to remember, or for me, speaking for myself, when I um, supported universal ma masking, that's what kept kids in school. <clears throat> and we needed to keep kids in school because we learned remote didn't work well last year. For every three of us had, had kids in school and knew it didn't work. So for me, going universal masking wasn't about taking away parents' rights. It wasn't about me knowing what's better for someone else's kid. It was kids being in school because they need to be in school. You know, remote doesn't work for everybody. I think that you're right. I, I, I think Dr. Morningstar is a great doctor. I think Dr. Flynn's a great doctor and I appreciate their opinion. And I think going optional is that now's the time, just like you said all along. I think we sent out a letter. Um, was it the week of the four school got out that said March 7th? We hear today now, like right at the final hour, March 9th, <laughs> you know? 
I think of the letters that we got from parents that were begging us to keep masks universal. And I think about them probably watching now. And if we say, no, it starts tomorrow, then they're terrified for their kids tomorrow. They, you know, so do I think parents should have the right to choose for their kids? Absolutely. But I think it's fair to say March 7th, go optional. You know, where we could go March 9th. And you said, like you said, we're bucking the recommendations just by doing what we're doing. You know, so we're, we're going against CDC recommendations. Everybody that thinks CDC is a bad, uh, a bad group, we're, we're bucking them right now by choosing March 7th. But, you know, I think we knew it. We know it. The letter went out. Let's just do March 7th. No, I mean, I, I really think we should go with March 7th. Does anybody have any other comments or questions or issues they would like to bring to the board? I'm prepared to support option landscape, but if things go the other way, we have no metrics, no way of saying, oh, it's getting a little worse. Oh, it's getting a little worse and a little worse. And so it would be nice if we go optional masking next Monday, the 7th, if we ask the superintendent or the school nurses to drop some metrics so that we had a sense of where we could be if there's another variant or if we have a surge or something happens that we, we don't anticipate so that we don't have to wait and wonder and we move into a gray area so we, we have a cutoff, we have a sense of where we're, where we're going to be worried again. Uh, so I think we can do that. It's, good. it's a great point. Uh, other superintendents have asked me what I thought of that and I told them that at some point if we get to the breakout level, that's something we may need to think about. That's 15% of your school population. We used it for every other matrix. Um, but flu. we're really not going to have a true number, right? Unless kids are actually home sick. Just right. like before COVID. Right. You know, like influenza A goes through a school. You don't really know until that percentage of your kids, because there's no way. Right. If we're, we're relying on some of the metrics of hospitalization, that has to be part of the mix. But I, I anticipate, exactly. I guess my point is, I'm looking at too much. I anticipate the SLP is going to have changes to kind of align more with what the governor's messaging is and some of the other stuff. So I agree with your points, Ron, but I also think we have to be mindful of what the SLP is going to tell us as well as part of that, that you know, of those metrics, because I, I, I think it's based on what you folks are, you're anticipating changes. I, I think we are. I also I agree as I've already met from Mr. Doe he had asked me like um, percentages of uh, just, just the cases that we have weekly. And so um, I do update that every week. So he has access just so we can kind of look and see, you know, this is what the cases are now, this is what they were, you know, maybe we see an influx of, of cases that we know about. And that has to be, you know, people telling us. But I think the yeah, SOP definitely is gonna come up with yeah. more guidance. Yeah. One other piece of this, because I was asked for this also, is um, so every Thursday they're supposed to update this color code, and I don't think we should be yo yoing back and forth every Thursday. So we got to have a matrix, like Ron is saying, not something that, you know, if you go from yellow and orange and back to yellow. And I never want to ever be part of something that says, oh, put the mask on this week, take the mask off next week. That's not, no. we're not doing that. I, I just want you to know that. So we do need a matrix. I always look at the breakout status. That's pretty severe. It's got to be, you know, it's at a, that's a high level. Of, of, so, you know, it, I always talk to Dr. Flynn weekly and it's not always COVID either. We talked about those other things. And I'm sure if we keep talking with Dr. Morristar and our medical advisors and, and watch our own cases in school, we, we will have a feeling. But there's a lot more home testing today than there ever was. And we may never hear about that. So. And I think kids, need consistency yes. and so and that's one of the reasons why i think the first you know year of covid was so hard in school because we were red we were yellow you know nothing was consistent and so i think having something like you said a matrix or whatever and you're not going week to week because that's that's when it really gets to people is when yeah, you, no. you, you keep with you know when we have to keep switching <clears throat> Any other questions? And the only other thing, too, I wanted to point out about the bullying. I'm hoping, you know, I'm going to throw a positive spin on this. The only, there's not a lot of places that we go into that everybody has to mask like school. You know, you go in the grocery store, there's some people mask, there's some people not mask. You go to church, there's some people mask, there's some people not mask. 
So I, I think we hopefully will give our kids enough credit that it's just going to be like when they're in the grocery store. Some people will have a mask and some people won't have a mask, you know, but in school, everyone does. And so it's, it's probably a, you yeah. think it might be difficult, but I hope it's easier. Though. I think I'm sure as administrators in their school, in their buildings, they're going to be mindful of that and think about how they may be proactive and use education and other elements to help combat any potential risk so that hopefully you know, it won't be an issue. And I think with a lot of things, sometimes it's more of an issue for the adults and the kids. The kids exactly. are happy to be at school with their friends. Any other questions or comments? If there's none, I would entertain a motion. I move we go optional masking on March 7th, as noted in the letter that was sent out the week before school vacation. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a second from Bethany. Any further discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll move into item 7.1a, calendar update. Yes. Um, so I'm sorry, but I we, I totally forgot to put this on, and I know I discussed it in an email, commission email. We're looking at taking the workshop day, the full workshop day, on March the 25th, which is a Friday, making it a half day workshop, half student day, half workshop day, which will make up a student day for a snow day, and uh, we're on the last day of school and now become Monday the 13th. You don't need a vote on that, right? We do, because we're changing the current calendar. All right, so just to make up a snow day, the half day will go to the 25th and 13th will be the last day. You want to vote on that? Is there a second? All in favor? Great motion carries. Thank you. Um, uh, then we have several policies that I believe went before the committee tonight, which is significant not to belabor them, but uh, <laughs> I guess I would, do you want to provide an overview or are we going to look at the recommendations from the committee? Would you like to <laughs> go through each one? Uh, there, it, I don't think it will take long, but I don't know if you have questions. You can, there, there are some minor, minor changes in each one. What's your recommendation? I would say if it's a minor change that we would defer to the committee for recommendation, if it's a more significant, I'd <coughs> have you review it. So it looks like as I look at 7.2 AC non discrimination equal opportunity from an action, it's like just some minor language semantic changes. The recommendation from the curriculum, the policy committee. Yeah. And I guess I'd, I'd like to also share with you one thing to preface this is this group of um, policies come before you because if you recall a couple of months ago, you approved the new student code of conduct policy, which had quite a few changes in it. And within that student code, code of conduct policy, it um, has all of these referenced, which is what caused us to make sure that these are up to date as well. So. That's why we're bringing such a large group before you to make sure that they are all in alignment. The other thing um, is that we do the policy uh, committee, uh, Mr. Willie and um, Mrs. Terrio, they have access to these 10, you know, seven to 14 days prior to the time that we get together. So they have an opportunity to review them right. and ask questions. And, and that's the purpose to... of the policy committee, that they vet for the, for the full board and they Correct. bring forth the recommendations. Correct. But I, you know, I just wanted to make it known that, you know, we spend a lot of time and then we meet prior to the board meeting to go over these. So by the time we come to you to present them or to share them with you, we've had um, quite a bit of time in conversations. Right, so on 7.2 AC non discrimination equal opportunity for action, I, there's a, a motion, a recommendation from the possible committee to approve. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? second? Any discussion? All in favor? Right, that policy passes. 7.3 AC AD hazing. Um, anything significant of note you want to highlight to the full board that the, requires further attention? The only thing I'd want to bring to your attention is on page three. Uh, the note that's in there, we do not want to include that, um, saying that it's uh, the written notice to parents. I don't have a page three. Not for hazing. Sorry. Oh, it's the next one. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, is there a recommendation from the policy committee? Is there a second? Any discussion? All in favor? 
Okay, policy carries. I, uh, 7.4 ADAA school system commitment to standards for ethical and responsible behavior. This must be where page three comes into play. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Sorry about that. Page three. The portion that says note, uh, the committee is recommending that we do not include that in the policy. Now I can see why. All right, with that in mind, I take it the recommendation is to approve it without that notation. Is there a motion? So, sounds like we had a motion there. Second. second. Any discussion? All in favor? Right, that policy carries. Uh, item 7.5 is ADC tobacco use and possession. Looks like there's a bit more entailing here in terms of some of the changes. We suggest it as the changes that are shared with you. It just looks more in depth and detail, right? I think it's because they added the baby. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Is there a motion? There's a second. Second. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Seven point six. Consider update the policy EBCC bomb threats. The recommendation you'll notice on page one, um, there is a highlighted section that is not included in the MSMA version or the recommendation, but it is in our current one. And we, the recommendation is that we keep that in the policy. It looks a little bit more clear in terms of lending clarity to the policy. Is that what the committee felt? Correct. Great. Is there a motion? So moved. There's a second. All in favor? Okay, motion carries. Uh, item 7.7 IHBAC child find. Yep, we would like to present it as as it is with no other suggested changes. Is there a motion? So moved. There's a second. All in favor? Motion carries. Uh, 7.8 consider updates to policy IJNDB student computer and internet use. This looks a bit more entailing. It is. Once again, it's a lot of updating verbiage because of the, the how devices and technology has changed. It's just more semantics and the bring it current. Correct. Okay. Um, and these policies were also reviewed by our technology director uh, prior to us bringing them before the committee. The recommendation uh, on page one, where there is, uh, it's the Third paragraph from the bottom where the or may be applied to the superintendent, appeal to the superintendent. We recommend that not be in there because we feel that's something that the building administrator should be able to deal with and shouldn't have to go to the superintendent. So we're recommending approval minus that clause. And also, um, page two, there's a place that says or, uh, or, or, students or, or students or parents, and we recommend that the and parents be taken out. That we are, we focus on educating the students, parents. With those, those only two. With those changes noted, is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Motion carries. And then I think we have one more. Well, we have a lot more than that. <laughs> Consider I J E N D B dash R student computer and internet use rule. I assume it's similar changes as the other one. Uh, page three, yes, where it says note, uh, we recommend that that be removed or I should say not included. Yeah, okay. Yep. I'm going to rule that. Anything else? That's all. I just get concerned if I explain the terms to the committee. We're not speaking. We're on. I hope that we accept the policy. Right, we have a motion there. Second. So moved. Yeah. All in favor? Great, thank you. Um, let me flip my page here. 7.10 JICIA weapons, violence, and school safety. We recommend it as is. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Okay. All in favor? Great, the motion carries. Thank you. Uh, 7.11 consider update to policy JICK bullying. On page four, we'd like to keep it at 14 calendar days. It states that at least an option is changing, but we, we want to stay with the 14. Great. Is there a motion to accept it with that change noted? So moved. There's a second. 
Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Great motion carries. 1.12 JK, student discipline. Just like to remind us that we're following uh, the addition of this in regards to the students uh, in grade five or below and how the uh, consequences are changed and that's due to LD 474. Just a reminder. Any questions? Is there a motion? I'll move <laughs> a motion from Bethany, is there a second? Okay. All in favor? Great, thank you. Um, JKD suspension of students. Once again, that addition is in being in compliance with the new law about students at that age. Great. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay, thank you. And then last but not least, expulsion of students, JKE. Same thing. That changes due to the new law. Any comments from the committee? Is there a motion then? So moved. There's a second. All in favor? Okay, that carries. Thank you very much. These are all final read, yeah. We should have said those still final read. I don't think we want to review them again. <laughs> Do the teachers get notified of the uh, student discipline changes? Yes, they are already aware. As far as the uh, talking about students in grades five and below, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, the recess thing. Yeah, that's something that we've been talking about and as, an, as an administrative team since early on in the year. And it's aware not a tool. These changes. It's, uh, but the thing, you can still have students stay in for recess if you're going to work with them about how to make better choices and their behaviors. It just can't be used as a punishment there. Have them sit at the desk with their head down, I think. It needs to be a conversation and some reteaching. No nose to the wall. Pardon me? No. <laughs> I said no, no nose to the wall. No, 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 that's, no. that's all evolution. Thank you. All right, moving into item A, assistant superintendent report. I'm all set for tonight. Oh, you are? Yes. Oh, okay. So we'll table eight by item eight. Okay. Oh, the pre K expansion right. grant. So right. yeah, I was talking about the learning loss. Oh, sorry. <laughs> nope, that's okay. Um, the pre-K expansion grant. So I, uh, we came to you, uh, I believe, a couple of board meetings ago, talked about we had applied for and received um, a pre-K expansion grant award. We were going to be uh, collaborating even more so with ACAP. When the grant was submitted, the, um, the numbers were not factual as we didn't have some of them. So once we got the actual factual numbers of what we would be um, having to put in from, from the RS239 portion of the grant, and then ACAP would put in a portion, it was much, much larger, our contribution would be. And in the grant, instead of getting um, you know $123,000, we were gonna be getting more like $22,000 thousand dollars which was a significant difference so in speaking with uh, even the people at ACAP that we've been collaborating with we really didn't feel that it this grant was worth continuing to pursue um, considering the fact that uh, you know the money was lesser and it's much a large a much larger portion than each of our institutions would have to put in we do feel that we could still do a lot of collaboration with our teachers and our staff together and we can continue to improve and improve communication and that doesn't have to be all of that funding. So we have decided to withdraw our application and not pursue that. Are there any questions for Superintendent Mr. Center Call? Great, right, thank you for the update. Certainly, obviously changes things make sense. I remember nine other matters. There's some committee meetings that will need to be scheduled going forward, a workshop with for the results of a parent survey, finance facilities, and negotiations. I assume we'll get some dates to kind of yeah, uh, Lori, I just wanted to make you aware, um, pretty much finished for the negotiation piece. I've got a few more things I just may add. We'll get a copy to you and Ron, Jan, and we can meet. Yeah. I have not heard from them about negotiating, so we still have time. Facilities, um, like every year, we have improvements to make, grounds, buildings, so we need to meet, finance. We now have a budget that's somewhat together. Um, still a lot of work ahead of us, and of course, as my part of my evaluation, I, I want to keep you abreast of this and re reengage with our schools movement. So, we did get our parents survey back. Pretty good information. I'll have Lori 
send something out. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, the big flowing shoe we have available. That would be great. Do we have any questions on that? Anything? No? How about the next meeting? Next meeting uh, is a double month. This is a, we're going to have a lot of meetings Monday, March, and everything else. But um, the next time would be the 16th or the 23rd, whatever works better. Which day? The 16th or 23rd is the. I cannot do the 23rd. Okay, so the 16th. Uh, you're happy to be with me. Is he okay? Mm -hmm. Um, Lindsay, anything to bring before the board under other matters? No. Jan. I do. So, <laughs> um, it's a good thing. Um, last Friday, I went and met with Jen Petra um, about the whole power hour. She had sent us all an oh, email yeah. and I responded. It's um, like, it is amazing. Uh, I, I see, I don't know why I was in there. I was in there for something. It was one of the first weeks and there was like a few uh, different sessions. And now like if you walk down the hall, they're all listed. There's a lot of sessions and it, it sounds like the numbers keep rising. She's got like amazing ideas. And one of the things I asked her, I'm like, so is there anything that you could, that the board could help you with? Um, and one of the things, one of the ideas, and April, I think, knows more about this, like, because we were just talking with, um, there used to be Project Explore in Presque Isle. Um, it, I, it's been gone a, for a while oh, yeah, now. That's right, I remember that. And she yeah, kind of has this idea to kind of, like, carry on um, Power Hour into, like, the week that school ends or the, you know, for like a week. And then I guess all the other, a lot of the other summer programs start like Tiger basketball camp and this and that. The problem being is our last day is on that Monday. And so um, I didn't, I said, well, I'll, I'll see. So I, cause I know the calendar falls under our thing. So I didn't know like if there was a way that like we could help that program out a little bit. If like, if kids are gonna participate in that week Maybe it could still count as school attendance for that day if they, or I don't know. I don't know, but like, I think it would be great because she also said, like, maybe we could, and maybe we just do it for Caribbean kids this year and open it up to other schools. That's in right. the future. She wants to, and yeah. I think that's great, you know. Yeah. Lee, um, Lee, we kind of discussed that. And I thought with ending on Monday, we're going to be okay. Yeah. So as long as we don't have another snow day, right. we're good to go right okay. now. But, so if I call another snow day, then it does bump into what she right. wants. That but might have been what she was saying. If kids take part in that program, and we've let kids uh, go hiking in Mount Tom and Winnie and Tom's school day, we'll work with that. Oh, yeah. So if we do get another snow day, which I was told we're done with snow, <laughs> <laughs> so we're not <laughs> Um, maybe like we could keep that in mind or yep. be creative so that because I think that program like, is yeah. great. There's a lot of, um, I, she's like, Full of energy. I would recommend if anybody's curious about it, the doctor. But oh, that was the other thing is um, no offense to like Mr. Pearl and like Mrs. Dion, but when I think about middle school, I think about home ec. Those were like the funnest classes I taught, took, and we always talk about we wish we still had home ec to be offered. And with this, you they're sewing, they're oh, yeah. sewing, they're, you know, they're off, they're almost able to offer like some home ec type things in this yeah. power hour yeah. and so it's just it's i'm like Sounds so like excited because that's what i envisioned with the new school with yeah. having this hour after school that kind of might help parents yeah. i'd like to see it open towards like for the younger kids too but like like she said a lot of it is like um you know the kids have to get from the cafeteria to their their session on their own and if the smaller the kids you can't just send them down right there. you know so it'd be neat eventually if we could get you know pre-k mm -hmm. through 12 but yeah. it was really good and exciting and i was excited after i talked to her well, i think that uh, meet with her yes great uh anything Jeffy? ron just just want to say that we think kids are hard here they can't get in ukraine kids are still going to school and then russians are on the way their, their kids are still in school and in ukraine we're, we're, we're going to be okay <laughs> <laughs> Seeing nothing further to bring before the board, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? All in favor?
Stand adjourned. Have a good evening.